And hello everyone, and I am on the wrong slide, so let me just go back real quick here. And welcome uh, to our last um, lecture on the dynamic ocean. Um, this will be the last of our oceanography lectures. Um, I might do uh, put up a thing on global climate change because I think that's kind of important. Um, actually, it's very important. But for the stuff that you guys are going to need to know uh, for the test, uh, this is going to be the end of it. So, yeah. So, what we want to talk about today is moving water around, right? We talked about the seafloor. Last time we talked about the water and the things living in the water. And so, today we're going to move some water around. And that's going to also bring us to uh, beach erosion, which is something that's very important. And yes, I'm scratching my eye because I need to scratch my eye. And that's going to lead us to beach erosion, uh, which is something that's very important uh, for us, especially here in Pinellas County, um, because uh, that's something that we have to deal with uh, all the time on our beaches. So let's uh, so let's uh, let's get there. Okay, so so um, you know the minute you start sailing, you know any distance at all from land. Uh, you begin to encounter um, surface circulation, right? And uh, these surface currents, and around here on the east coast of the U.S., especially in Florida, uh, the Gulf Stream, which you can see right here, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a few minutes, but the Gulf Stream there um, is one of the most important ones. Um, and, you know, they, these currents are like these rivers of water, if you will, in the oceans. And so, and you can see here that um, in the northern hemisphere uh, they go mostly clockwise and in the southern hemisphere they go mostly counterclockwise there's an exception here the Alaska current goes the quote-unquote wrong way and we'll talk a little bit about that um, but you know mostly clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere and this is a very simplified diagram of all this it's actually much more complicated than this but this gives you the general idea so what's going on here why why is this happening? Well, three things go into shaping these currents. Uh, the first is wind, right? Once you get out over the ocean, uh, you know, there, there's really nothing to stop the wind. And we set up these large scale, very persistent winds as a result of these things called Hadley cells. Uh, and so, you know, let me show you uh, the picture of the, um, of the currents again. If I was to show you a picture of the wind out there, it would look almost exactly the same and so there's very persistent wind out there blowing pretty much all the time uh, that drives that surface water uh, the other thing is the Coriolis effect um, and you know it's funny because this is the second time I've done this let's started this lecture because I realized oh wait I need to do that Coriolis effect demo uh, somehow do it on camera and I could not figure out how to make that work. It just it was awful So I will find a video on the Coriolis effect uh, and link to it if you're interested, but basically the Coriolis effect um, is why the circulation patterns in the northern hemisphere go clockwise and in the southern hemisphere go counterclockwise uh, and it's because the earth is spinning so an object moving across the face of the Earth will be deflected to the right of its path in the northern hemisphere, which is why you get this um, uh, clockwise circulation, and the left of its path in the southern hemisphere, which is why you get counterclockwise circulation. Um, and once again, it's because the Earth is spinning. Um, and I will link to, uh, uh, I'll find a good uh, video on that to link you guys to in case you're curious uh, about exactly how that works. But, but it does. And so uh, the Coriolis affects water. It affects wind. It does not affect your toilet, by the way. Your toilet swirls the way it does because of the little jets are pointed in some way or another. It's not the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect really works best on, you know, large things moving over long distances and long times uh, that have plenty of time to be affected by it. So, so uh, Coriolis effect. And then the third thing is the continents, right? The placement of the continents. Water is not going to run up onto a continent just because, you know, it thinks it should because the Coriolis effect says it should, right? I mean, if we look here, the North Pacific Current, you know, breaks off into the California Current, goes off the coast of, oddly enough, California. But then also the Alaska Current here going up into the Gulf of Alaska and actually actually going um, counterclockwise in the Northern Hemisphere. But, you know, because it's 
following the coastline and so so the placement of continents is a, is a big deal too so anyway those three things um <clears throat> oh sorry wrong way those three things um <clears throat> large-scale persistent wind, uh, the Coriolis effect, and then the shape of the continents will go into, will go into um, where, determining where those, where those currents are going to go, <coughs> sorry, and so yeah, so um, one current in particular, I mentioned briefly the Gulf Stream right here, uh, the Gulf Stream is a, is a fascinating current, it was first, um, you know, described um, by Benjamin Franklin when he was Postmaster General of the United States. I'm sure people before Benjamin Franklin, you know, knew about the Gulf Stream. I'm just, he's the first, you know, uh, person of European heritage to write about it. Once again, as we did in astronomy, let's not assume the first European dude was the first person to ever do something, because likely not. But it's interesting because he was Postmaster General of the United States, and he noticed very consistently that it took mail longer to come from Europe than it took it to go to Europe, right? So, you know, so you send a letter to, you know, France or wherever, and, you know, it takes, I don't know, how long does it take to cross the Atlantic with a square rig sailing ship? Let's, let's say two weeks, right? And so it takes two weeks to get there. And then they send a letter back and it takes three weeks to get back, right? And so, um, uh, yeah, and, and this was like over and over and over again. And so he was wondering why this was. And he talked with his brother-in-law, who was a fisherman. And his brother-in-law says, oh, yeah, there's a current out there. Strong one. Uh, it goes, you know, it runs to the north, off the coast of New England, you know, where those dudes were hanging out at the time. And, you know, ships going, going to England are going to be sailing with the current. Ships coming back are either going to be avoiding the current or beating into the current, most likely avoiding it. And it's just a longer route back. And so, um, so he drew a map. Uh, and you can see it here, and you can see a little outlet here, and yeah, now we have much better maps now. This is a Topex Poseidon sea surface temperature plot, um, which shows um, the Gulf Stream here off the coast of Florida, almost on the beach in Miami, and then as you get further up, it gets a little bit further off the beach, but you can also see how it is just pumping warm water into the North Atlantic. Uh, and it turns out that this makes a difference. This makes a big difference. Uh, let me show you one more thing. Uh, and let me go back here to do it, actually. See here where uh, where this current is in the Gulf of Mexico? They call it the Florida current. Um, it might, uh, we tend to call it the loop current, though, because it loops up into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, they show it in one particular place, but it actually moves around a lot here. And um, the location of that loop current has a lot to do uh, with our hurricane forecasting, in particular, our strength forecasting. That water is warm, and uh, when hurricanes go over warm water, they tend to spin up. And so uh, during hurricane season, especially, we play a lot of attention to where that loop current is there in the uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And if we go back to that sea surf with that Topex Poseidon plot, you can see all this warm water here, right? That's the loop current looping around and then up. Oh, sorry, my finger got in the way. Looping around and then up off the coast of Miami and up into the uh, up into the North Atlantic. Now, now the Gulf Stream is a warm water current. Uh, in that it is generally warmer than the water around it. We can divide the surface currents up into warm and cold water. And if we look here, here's another very simple diagram, but showing, you know, the difference between warm and cold water currents, right? And so, you know, the Gulf Stream here uh, is a warm water current. It comes down from the uh, comes up rather from the equator off the east coast and then pumps warm water here up into the north atlantic right it also part of it curves back down where it's a cold water current right because it's coming from the north we define warm or cold really just relative to the um to the water around them right so a current absolutely can turn from a warm water current to a cold water current as it moves around the globe um well right away something gets obvious right if we look here once again, this is an overly simplified diagram. But if we look here, we understand why, you know, uh, the water off the coast of California is cold, while the water, you know, over here off the east coast of the U.S. is not nearly that bad, right? I mean, you know, when I was in the Marine Corps, I was stationed, you know, right about there in Virginia for a little while. You know, we go to the beach 
all the time, you know, uh, jump in the water, have a good time, water's warm, kind of the way it is down here, you know, not a problem, then, you know, I get uh, stationed, you know, across the way here in California, you know, and we spend a lot of time in San Francisco, you don't go in the water in San Francisco, it's cold, it's very cold, but it's at about the same latitude as Virginia, about, it's a little further north, it looks like, but not much, but, you know, but the difference here isn't latitude, it's where is the water coming from, right? Here off the east coast of the U.S., that water's coming up from the equator. It's relatively warm, pretty dang far north. And then um, and then off the west coast, uh, that water's coming from the Gulf of Alaska. It's cold, right? Makes a huge difference. So, yeah, so, so the, these, you know, these currents have an effect on, you know, water temperature off of our coast, but they also have an effect on climate. Uh, generally speaking, right, warm water currents really do tend to moderate uh, temperatures um, in places like England and Northern Europe, right, let's go back to this picture again, and you can see how the Gulf Stream is pumping all kinds of warm water up here into the Northern Atlantic, this tends to make these, you know, these areas not quite as cold as maybe they should be, now don't get me wrong, this water is cold, you fall off the boat, you're going to die, okay, of hypothermia. It's cold, okay, but let's just think about this for a second. It's not as cold as it should be, and these countries up in here in northern Europe are maybe not as cold as they should be either given their latitude, right? Let me show you. So, so, um, so I went and found some climate data for, uh, for London, all right, and so in particular in the winter, and so uh, we can see that, you know, December, uh, you know, high of, you know, 48, uh, low of 40, January, high of 48, not even below freezing, 32 is freezing, right? If I was to follow a line of latitude just across this map, I suddenly realized that London is further north than anywhere in the United States, right? But yet it is not nearly as cold as it should be given its latitude. I mean, I mean, the temperatures here in like central Canada and, you know, um, uh, the mid, the northern Midwest of the United States, it gets, it gets cold there. It gets very cold there. Negative 20 and just cold, you know, doesn't get that cold in London. It just doesn't. In fact, the closest analog I could find to London, and I didn't look a whole lot, but, you know, about the same wintertime temperatures as, you know, Washington, D.C. And, in fact, Washington, D.C. gets a little bit colder. These are the wintertime highs. So, you know, so so a, you know, in a location this far north is not getting nearly as cold as it should. Okay, and why not? Because, oh, what, did I, I did not go the wrong way. What did I do? Here we go. Because of this warm water current. It just did not go that far uh, or does not get that cold. And so, yeah, so, so you know, this current plays a huge role in, in moderating the climate up here. It just keeps it from getting that cold. The other thing is cold water currents um, are commonly associated with deserts. Now, I'm not saying they cause deserts. Desertification, and yes, that's a word. Um, is a complicated thing, and there's different kinds of deserts, there's latitudinal deserts, there's rain shadow deserts, there's all kinds of different kinds of deserts, but one thing that always gets thrown into the mix is what kind of water do you have offshore, because it seems like cold water currents and deserts kind of go together, right, if I look here, um, if I look, for example, here, uh, cold water current off the coast of Africa, Kalahari Desert, there. Cold water current here, Sahara Desert, there, right? Um, you know, cold water currents here off the coast of Australia, you know, look, all of, you know, western Australia is, is you know, pretty much desert. Um, um, let's see, if I come up here... Um, Cold water current here, you got the Chihuahuan Desert there, you got the Mojave Desert there, uh, cold water current here, Atacamba Desert right there, the driest point on the surface of the earth is right there, although to be honest, that has more to do with the Andes Mountains than it does the current, but still gets thrown in the mix right now, not always. Cold water current here, temperate rainforest there in the Pacific Northwest, so, you know, you know, temper your expectations, but still, it's enough of a thing 
uh, that people people tend to take notice. So so when we talk about climate um, climate and these currents, uh, you know, warm water currents, especially in places like northern England, tend to moderate temperature. And cold water currents are um, I'm not saying they cause deserts, but they tend to go with deserts. So it's uh, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon. It makes sense um, when people think deserts, they tend to think hot. Don't think hot. Think cold. Or rather, I'm sorry, don't think hot, think dry. And so, uh, you know, colder um, uh, colder air holds less moisture, less moisture is dry, and dry is desert. So it, it, it kind of makes sense. Like I said, um, forming desert is complicated, but but that certainly gets thrown into the mix when we think about it. So let's, uh, let's uh, speaking of thinking about things, let's remember the fish poo. Y'all remember the fish poo? Everyone remembers the fish poo, right? Years after taking my class, uh, everyone remembers the fish poo. So, so you've got all these fish um, in the upper part of the water column, and they are, of course, animals, and they are eating, and, of course, they have to go to the bathroom, and they do it in the water. We talked about this last time. And uh, what this causes is a buildup of nutrients um, on the bottom of the ocean in that very, very deep water. Uh, one reason the nutrients build up is there's no sunlight down there. So there's nothing doing photosynthesis, and so there's nothing to take up the nutrients and turn it into, you know, a bioavailable thing. Uh, you know, you can't eat fertilizer, right? So we need a primary producer to turn those nutrients into living tissue, and there aren't any down there, or at least not many down there. Uh, so what we want to do, if we can, is uh, get that, that cold, nutrient-rich water up to the surface. And doing that is called upwelling. Uh, it is very common on the western coast of continents, in particular Africa and North America. And what happens here is the wind blows the surface water offshore. And that draws that colder, nutrient-rich water to the surface. Let's take a look at how this works. So off of um, the west coast of Africa, and I could go to Google Earth, but I'm going to go into Google Earth plenty uh, with the beach erosion stuff, so let's avoid it for now. But just trust me that off the west coast of Africa and the west coast of um, South America, the water gets very deep, very near shore. And so, uh, and so what ends up happening here at particular latitudes is you have a very persistent wind blowing onshore to offshore. Well, as that wind blows offshore, it blows that water offshore, right? And so as the water blows offshore, that creates a sort of a, a vacuum here, a water vacuum, if you will, or a suction effect there. And basically, it draws that deep, nutrient-rich water up, right? And so what you end up with is this body of very, very cold, very, very nutrient-rich water right there near shore. Um, and we can take a look. Here's a sea whiffs image of um, the west coast of South Africa, um, uh, the country, not the region. And so now sea whiffs was always kind of weird. Um, red is cold. Right. And so when you look at this, you can see um, that, you know, all you can see this huge body of cold water right there. That water came up from the deep. And so it's very nutrient rich and it's right there, right there next to Africa. And so or next to shore. And so what happens is the, the phytoplankton go insane. Here's a picture from the European Space Agency showing um, showing this. see this green running down here. Uh, off, this is also off the coast of Africa, but you see that green? That green is phytoplankton, visible from space, okay? And so, uh, and where there's phytoplankton, there's zooplankton, and where there's plankton in general, there's fish. And so this, 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 um, this uh, upwelling, you know, produces, um, you know, commercial level fishing, you know, right there near shore. You don't even need a boat. You just need a dock and a net in a lot of cases. And so, uh, you know, this is very, very good for the people who live there because, you know, while here in America we get our protein from, you know, pork and cows and chickens and all kinds of things, most of the world gets most of their protein from fish. Okay, I'm not going to make up numbers, but most of the world gets most of their protein from fish. And so this upwelling uh, is very important for a lot of people who live near shore because this is where they get their food. And so it's a very important thing. Uh, another um, thing that happens with respect to this upwelling is something called El Nino. 
And El Nino is something that happens every few years. Um, uh, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's weak. Uh, and, you know, uh, and it affects the weather across the entire planet. And what El Nino essentially is, I mean, at, at its most basic, is a movement of warm water across the Pacific Ocean. That's it, right? Good, strong El Nino years. You will hear people blame everything on El Nino, um, and maybe it is. But, but all it really is is just warm water moving across the Pacific Ocean. Let me show you. So, so under normal circumstances, um, you'll get a, a pretty strong trade wind blowing, uh, in this case, across the Pacific from South America over here to, you know, Indonesia, um, uh, New Zealand, etc. Um, over here. And um, so you'll get this body of warm water on, on the uh, western side of the Atlantic Ocean blown over there uh, by the wind. Uh, that causes upwelling here, and so you'll get upwelling off of the west coast of South America. Good fishing, everyone's happy, life is good, right? Well, every now and then, that wind that keeps that, um, that warm water on the western side of the Pacific Ocean breaks down, and that warm water moves back. This shuts down the upwelling. And so the fishing kind of goes away for a little while. Um, this phenomenon was named El Nino because when it happens, it usually happens around Christmas time. And so the locals in South America named it after the Christ child because it comes the same time Jesus does. And so it came to be called El Nino. Uh, and so, yeah, so it's just, it really is just this movement of warm water. And that's what this, this sea surface temperature plot was showing you is that, you know, what El Nino is, is all this warm water butted here up against South America, where maybe it should be further off to the west, right? It's not a huge disaster thing. I mean, like I said, the locals kind of expect it. They take some time off. You know, and then and then it goes back to normal and everything kind of resumes. But here's the trick. Basically, you can't move that much warm water that far without affecting the weather pretty much everywhere. Um, and so you don't need to know this stuff or anything. But I just want to show you how, you know, this affects the weather everywhere uh, in the wintertime and the following summer. And for us, by the way, here in Florida... A good, strong El Nino will shut down hurricane season. Um, it, it, it creates these upper-level winds that just blow the tops off of hurricanes. So we hope for good, strong El Nino years because uh, hurricane season in the Atlantic is suppressed um, by a uh, by a good, strong El Nino. So it's so so when it happens, you'll hear a lot about it, but that's fundamentally what it is: is this warm water moving across the Pacific Ocean because those trade winds have broken down a little bit. Um, and then there's also um, a vertical circulation in the world's oceans called deep ocean circulation. Uh, this is driven by changes in density. Uh, and it's sometimes called thermohaline circulation. And that's a word that I really like. Thermohaline. Here it is right here. Let me move my water so I can point. So here it is right here. Um, thermo temperature haline salt. Right. And so this is a, a, a circulation that's driven by changing the water's temperature and changing the water's salinity, which, as we know from our last um, uh, lecture, are the two things that affect the water's density. Right. And so what we're going to do is we're going to begin this at or near the poles. And we're going to do it, we're going to begin it by making sea ice, right? And so what happens then is we make sea ice. Well, sea ice does two things. Uh, first of all, it means the water is cold. Uh, but also, remember that making sea ice increases the water's salinity. So I've got water that is both salty and cold, and that is kind of the maximum um, scenario for making water dense, right? If you can make it salty and cold, it'll be dense, and it sinks, right? And it moves from the North Pole, it moves southward. From the South Pole, it moves northward, right? Now, this is a heat budget diagram, but it gives you the idea, right? And it is that you get this ice forming at, at either pole, 
uh, and then sinking because it is both salty and cold and a little bit of mixing but mostly it stays as a coherent body moving along the bottom of the ocean floor toward the equator so it moves northward from the south pole and southward from the north pole not far we're talking not fast uh, far yes not fast though we're talking you know feet per day here so it's not it's not tearing along the bottom but it is there and so what this means though is that all of the the um all of the uh, the water in the world's oceans has come from somewhere and is going somewhere um you know uh if you if you sample down through the water uh what you'll find is uh, a body at the bottom of what's called Antarctic bottom water. This is water that came from the Antarctic. It's a little bit colder. It's a little bit saltier. And so it is more dense. And so it will, um, you know, it will um, uh, be on the bottom. And then on top of that is North Atlantic deep water, NADW. Once again, North Atlantic deep water. It comes from the North Pole. It's a wee bit warmer, so it rides up over the Antarctic bottom water. In the middle of that, you have intermediate water in the um in the atlantic a lot of the intermediate water comes from uh the mediterranean uh which isn't cold but it is salty and so it tends to be maybe a wee bit more dense and so it ends up being intermediate and then surface water formed uh by um you know uh, kept on the surface because it's being kept warm by sunlight and whatnot right and so remember this from the if you've done it uh from the lab on water density you know um that's three um different solutions saline solutions um with three different densities right and so um you know the red is the most dense the the white or clear is in between it and the green is the least dense right and so uh you know we can stack water up like that in a lab just the way it's stacked up like that out there in the real world uh things tend to separate themselves by density antarctic bottom water is more dense north atlantic deep water is a little bit less followed by intermediate followed by surface right and so yeah so so all that water out there it's not just sitting there it's come from somewhere and it's going somewhere too so um but you know one of the most obvious ways that water is going somewhere is the tides right i mean you go to the beach uh and you know you um you know you hang out there for a whole afternoon and you're probably going to see a change in the depth of the water not as extreme as you see here uh but you're probably going to see a change in the depth. This is uh, the Bay of Fundy in um, northeastern Canada. It is uh, the site that has the largest tidal range of, I believe, anywhere in the world. There's like a, in places, a 70 foot difference uh, between high tide and low tide. And you can see here, if you have a boat, you need two things. You need a sturdy keel that it can sit on and you need a rope to tie it to the dock uh, because it's going to be sitting on a keel twice a day. Uh, this is not some weird freakish thing. This happens twice a day. Okay, so why? What, what What's going on here? Well, okay, so what's going on here is um, gravity, right? And so, so let's think first about the gravity of the moon. And um, give me, uh, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay, sorry. Um, I usually do a YouTube video right now, but I'm not going to because those tend to uh, encounter copyright issues. So the gravity of the moon. So the gravity of the moon will pull on the earth and it will pull a bulge of water on the side of the, um, the the sphere of the earth that's facing the moon. That bulge is going to always face the moon. And then as the earth spins, it spins into and then out of that bulge. And so if you think about that, you know, what's going to happen is as you spin into that bulge, um, it'll be high tide. As you spin out of the bulge, it will be low tide, High tide, low tide, high tide, low tide. And so in this scenario so far, you'll get, um, you'll get, um, you'll get, sorry, <laughs> you'll get one tidal bulge and you'll get one high tide and one low tide in a 24 hour period. Okay. Now, um, the second bulge is a little more difficult for people to understand because here's a trick, right? You don't get one high tide and one low tide. You get two. Right. In Pinellas County, we get two high tides and two low tides a day Okay, in a 24-hour period. So where is that second bulge coming from? Well, it's coming 
front centripetal force. And so remember from astronomy that the moon is about a quarter the size of the Earth, right? That's a pretty dang big moon. And I know that we like to think about the moon as going around the Earth, but the center of gravity for that system is actually not the center of the Earth. It's out here. And what I mean by that is as the moon goes around the Earth, the Earth is going to swirl a little bit around that center of gravity and I just happen I don't know if this will work or not we'll see but I just happen to have a cup here a clear cup uh, with some water in it right and if I hold it up in front of the camera there we go and if you can't make it out you can imagine what's going to happen though if I move this cup like this that water makes a bulge on the outside as it moves around okay and so that is that second bulge um, if we were in the classroom, I would have taken a beaker and put some water in it and done it for you. But imagine, you know, if you imagine the Earth here kind of swirling around that center of gravity, that water is going to go, whoa, and it's going to go to the outside, right? It's kind of like when your friend drives around that corner too fast in your car and you want to go straight, the car wants to turn. And if they're turning hard enough, you're going to get pushed to the outside of that car. Same thing with the water. It's going to get pushed to the outside as the Earth swirls around that berry center right there that balance point between the earth and the moon so two bulges two two bulges right you know, can you see there we go two bulges right and so one on the side of the moon made straightforwardly enough by gravity okay the other on the other side kind of it ends up opposite the moon uh made by the earth swirling around that berry center uh and that water going whoa and it gets pushed out to the outside as the earth does that so two bulges so now the bulges hold still mostly, and the Earth spins. And so as you spin into a bulge that's high tide, you spin out of a bulge that's low tide, then high tide, and then low tide. And as you spin in and out of these bulges of water, you will get high tide and low tide and high tide and low tide. Okay, now, every now and then, though, the tidal ranges are big. Um, and so very big, right? Uh, you know, sometimes the high tide's really, really high and the low tide's really, really low. Other times, meh, not so much. Around Pinellas County, you mostly see that during the low tide. Now, every now and then, uh, you know, you'll drive over to Tampa or something, uh, you know, when we're allowed to do that kind of thing again. Uh, and you look out and you see these huge tidal flats out there in Tampa Bay, right? Um, and that is a spring tide. That is a particularly low, low tide. And I can almost promise you uh, that when you see that, um, that low, low tide, the moon is either new or full or very nearly that, either like, you know, a, a, a crescent or a gibbous, but mostly new or full. Because what's happening here is when the moon is new, Remember back from astronomy, when the moon is new, it's more or less in between the Earth and the sun, right? And so now the moon's gravity is pulling a bulge of water. So is the sun's gravity. And so the combined gravity of the sun and the moon pull a larger bulge of water, which makes a higher high tide. Since they're pulling water off of here, you get a lower low tide, right? And so you'll get, you know, a lowest tide. Um, a very low tide rather and then a very high tide and then a very low tide and a very high tide as you spin around through these bulges um, during third and first quarter let's say um, the bulge is going to follow the moon the moon the, the water feels the moon's gravity a lot more than it feels the earth the sun's gravity and so that bulge is going to follow the moon only now the moon's gravity and the sun's gravity aren't lined up so the moon pulls a smaller bulge during third and first quarter. And so you'll get, you know, you'll get, um, yeah, you'll get some, you know, you'll get a bulge, you'll get tides, but they won't be nearly as, um, as big as the spring tides. So, uh, spring tides happen, you know, twice a month during new moon and full moon. Neap tides happen, uh, kind of twice a month, third quarter and first quarter. You can, you can imagine how they're, you know, they vary continuously as the, as the moon, of course, goes around the earth. So there's what I, there's what I just said. Um, you've got it in your notes, so you have it. You don't need me to read that to you again, but there it is. So yeah, so now interestingly though, it's not just the gravity of the moon and the sun. You know, because, look, look, right, okay. <laughs> if the Earth were a perfectly smooth, you know, ball, I'm trying to get myself, there we go, morning camera, there we go. If the Earth were a perfectly smooth 
ball bearing like thing, then you would get two high tides and two low tides every month. Um, but the earth is not like that, right? The earth has, has continents and that water has to go around those continents, right? It has to slosh, you know, into and out of, you know, basins and, and do all kinds of weird things. And so, so it's not as simple as, you know, two high tides and two low tides. Certainly two high tides and two low tides is possible. Um, and when you get that, it's called a diurnal tide. You can see that here. Two, you know, two high tides, two low tides, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, in some places, um, you'll get four high tides and four low tides in a 24-hour period. Now, in, on the Gulf Coast of Florida, we have diurnal tides, too high and too low. But if you go over to the east coast of Florida, uh, they have um, they have semi-diurnal tides. They'll have four high tides and four low tides in a 24 hour period some places um some places have mixed ties the west coast of the united states um has mixed ties where yeah you'll get four high and four low but some of the highs are higher some of the lows are lower and that water just sloshes around it's interacting with the uh with the shoreline it's interacting with the bottom it's doing all kinds of weird things and the funny thing about tidal cycles is they don't make any sense they don't make any sense at all uh, you know, when I look at this, you can see here that, you know, the Gulf of Mexico has, you know, diurnal tides, too high and too low in a 24-hour period. But once again, the east coast of the U.S. has semi-diurnal, four high and four low. But for some reason, for example, right there in the Caribbean, it switches to mixed, right? Right here, it switches from semi-diurnal up here to mix down here. Uh, you know, one side of India has one kind, the other side has another kind. And I would really love for an oceanographer sometime to explain to me why you have such different tidal patterns in such small geographic areas, because I don't know. I mean, Australia is just outlined with all kinds of different colors with different kinds of tides. So um, so I don't, I don't know why <coughs> in different places have these different uh, tidal patterns, but they do. And I just, I find it fascinating. I mean, this little area right here, right? You've got three different tidal patterns, uh, you know, just, just right there. It's just, it's really, is just fascinating. So anyway, don't know why, kind of fun. Um, okay, so let's take a little bit about waves. So the first thing we want to get is that waves are transmitting uh, energy from one place to another, not water okay the water in a wave is just going to move from one uh, uh place it's going to go in a circle it's going to right back where it starts uh, waves in the open ocean don't move water they move energy and that energy comes from the wind this is really the wind unless it's a tsunami which is a totally different thing um but um, but wind is what what makes waves so if we think about this for one second Let's say that you surf and that you live in Oklahoma in the middle of North America and you want to take a surfing vacation. You're not going to go to the east coast of the U.S. You're going to go to the Pacific, right? Bigger waves in the Pacific, right? So you're going to do that. Uh, you, you're not going to go to the Atlantic because odds are the waves are going to be bigger in the Pacific. Um, let's say you live in Orlando and you want to go surfing. Uh, you don't drive to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, you drive to the Atlantic, right? Because they're given a choice between the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic. The Atlantic is going to be better than the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, better being having bigger waves. Um, if you live in Pinellas County and you want to go surfing, <laughs> good luck. But at least go to the Gulf of Mexico side, right? No one goes surfing in Tampa Bay. The waves simply aren't big enough. So it seems like we have big, the largest waves in the Pacific. And then a little bit smaller in the Atlantic, a little bit smaller in the Gulf of Mexico, and then the smallest in Tampa Bay. So it would seem that the size of the wave is proportional to the size of the body of water. Which is one of those things that kind of makes intuitive sense. You know, okay, well, the bigger the wave, the, the, the bigger the body of water, the bigger the wave, right? That, that makes sense, you know, but, you know, like we talked about with Galileo, Heavier things should always fall faster. Yeah, they should, but they don't. So, you know, so let, let's, let's think a little bit about why larger bodies of water seem to be producing larger waves. And it has to do with fetch. 
Fetch is the distance over which the wind can blow undisturbed, right? And the Pacific has a huge amount of fetch uh, that the wind can blow over undisturbed. And so it really does tend to pile up waves um, and make these really big waves because there is so much fetch, right? Now, we can make up for the lack of fetch in the Gulf of Mexico, right? With a hurricane right now don't go surfing in a hurricane because you know don't do that but you know i go to the beach sometimes when there's storms out there and the waves are pretty dang big right because if the wind is blowing you know a hundred miles an hour yeah you're going to make some waves you're definitely going to make some waves and so the speed of the wind also matters the other thing that matters i'm just going to switch the slide it's just going to switch the words not the picture the duration of the wind right how long is the wind blowing for right that makes a huge difference right and so you in a perfect world you've got wind blowing uh really fast for a very long time and over a large area right those three things are what will go into making a nice good big you know surfable wave right um wind blowing over a long uh a large distance for a long time and very quickly take away any one of those things and the size of the wave starts going down okay now um, once we have a wave there's a little bit of anatomy we want um, and uh, first of all is the wave height so you know when people say I don't know seas are running three to five feet right what they're saying what they're talking about is the wave height this is commonly how we measure the size of a wave right it's the it's the distance from the trough of the wave to the crest of the wave that's the wave height right and that, that is commonly what people think of when they think of you know how big is the wave they want to know how tall it is what's maybe more important for a couple reasons um is wave length right that's the distance from uh from the uh, the the sorry the crest of one wave to the crest of another wave uh that's the wavelength right measure it in meters feet whatever okay the reason wavelength is important though is because wavelength determines wave base wave base is the depth below which the water is no longer moving due to the wave if you're below wave base you will not even know the wave is there uh, it'll pass right over your head right now if the water depth is shallower than wave base there's no getting under the wave right and so now you're in that zone that we talked about last time the wave wash tidal zone right if your average wavelength is let's just say 20 feet um so in you know any water depth shallower than 10 feet you're not getting under that wave you're going to feel it one way or another you're going to feel it so and and once again that wave base is one half of the wave length which is weird you would think it would be wave height you really would but it's not it's wavelength so one half of the wavelength um and then finally wave period is just the time that it takes for one wavelength to pass a fixed point that's it so wave period right so you're standing in the water and bam you get hit with a wave and 20 seconds later bam you have another wave wave period 20 seconds so yeah so um Okay, now I mentioned in the open ocean that waves just move energy, right? They're not moving water. The water ends up going in a circle here. The water does this, right? The water just goes in a circle as the wave goes by and ends up right back where it started. But at the beach, that changes, right? Once the water depth is shallower than wave base, that's one half the wavelength, that wave is going to start interacting with the bottom. It's going to start moving sand. It's going to start ripping things up. And it's also going to slow down. And when it slows down, that allows the waves offshore to catch up. That shortens up the wavelength. Um, and then eventually, um, you know, the wave can no longer hold itself together. And in a water depth of, I want to say, about 140th the wavelength, uh, the wave finally just falls apart and crashes on the beach, right? Crashes. We should put little air quotes around crashes, right, for Pinellas County because they're never that big. But, you know, but you can see this. You can. This is a photograph that I just took. I don't know. I was on St. Pete Beach or Clearwater Beach or maybe probably Indian Rocks because that's where I tend to go. But, but you know, you can see here there's a wave. There's another wave right behind it. There's another wave right behind it and another wave right behind there, right? You know, they're, they're stacked up. 
right? And then once again, once the water uh, gets gets shallow enough, the whole thing will just fall apart. And you can see this nice, pretty tube here that surfers just love in that wave where that water is kind of moving in a circle around them. Remember, the water in the wave is always moving in a circle. It's just as it gets into that shallower water, there's no longer enough water to fill in the middle. And so you're kind of left with the outside of that tube until finally the whole thing falls apart and breaks on the shore. Now, from the time that wave started to feel bottom out here, right, when the water depth shallowed up shallower than wave base, uh, to the time it breaks on the beach around your ankles, it's no longer just moving energy. Now it's doing what a physicist would call work. It's actually moving sand and rocks and things like that. And unfortunately, what it tends to do is it tends to... Um, to remove sand from places we would rather it not be and place it in places we would rather it be. And so it, it moves sand in very, uh, shall we say for now, inconvenient ways, which brings us to beach erosion with the scary font. Um, and so um, hey, you guys aren't hardly going to know this, but I, it's, it's, I've been going for 45 minutes. I'm going to take a few minutes break. We'll pick back up with beach erosion. From your point of view, I will be right back in one second. Okay, I'm back. You guys think these lectures are boring to watch? You should try being the one that does them. No, anyway, not that bad. Um, I just, I just miss having you know an audience sitting up here and doing them um, in a in a home office is really not the same. So anyway, okay, so let's talk a bit about beach erosion. This is something, as I said earlier, something that's very important. I mean, this is something that we have to deal with in Pinellas County all the time. Um, and it's something that we end up spending tax dollars on and all kinds of things. So, so it ends up being, being a great big deal. So when, when a geologist or a coastal oceanographer go to, go to the beach, what we really see is a river of sand. That sand that you see on the beach is by no means holding still, especially down there, you know, in the surf and, you know, in the water. It's really just not. There's two things that are moving sand along a beach, beach drift and the longshore current. So let me, let's take a look at the drawing. And so, um, and so when you go to the beach next time, notice that the waves are rarely, if ever, coming straight into the beach. They're usually coming at an angle. In Pinellas County, it is usually from the north, although not always, but usually from the north. And so what this does is this constant wave energy coming along the beach like this at an angle sets up two things. The first thing it sets up is something called the longshore current, right here, right offshore. I mean, literally, waist chest deep water, right? You have all experienced a longshore current. I know you have, right? You go to the beach, you stake out your umbrella, you, you know, got your cooler, you got your towel, you got your chair, whatever, and you jump in the water, not very deep, but you jump in the water, and you're playing in the water, and you're playing in the water, and you're playing in the water, and you look up, and you're 50 yards downstream from your stuff. Your stuff is up here, you're down here, right? Um, congratulations, you just discovered the longshore current, right? And if you go to walk back up, you might realize it might be a little easier to get out and just walk up on the beach. Um, it's you know, it's, it, it can be a pretty strong current. If it gets really strong, it can turn into a rip current, which is a whole other thing. Okay, but as that current flows, it moves sand along the beach, right? The other thing is, as you know, as the waves break on the beach. They move sand up the beach, and then when the surf comes back, then back down the beach, the next wave breaks, moves it up the beach, down the beach, up the beach, down the beach. And you know, if you stand right here and just let that water wash up around your ankles, your feet get covered in sand pretty dang fast. And so, um, and so, yeah, so both of these move sand. Um, uh, I have two numbers, New Jersey, about 750,000 tons per year. California, it's about a million and a half per year. Uh, around uh, Pinellas County, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, guys, don't have the plague, I have allergies. And so, um, around Pinellas County, it's about, it's about a million tons per year. So what I'm saying is if you stand on Clearwater Beach for a year, a million tons of sand get moved past your location that is a lot of sand um that is an awful lot of sand and i need to cough again 
<coughs> that is an awful lot of sand. So, um, and we can't always have that sand moving around, right? Your book has a section called Stabilizing the Shore. At least I think it does. I haven't looked at a pile. I should probably check that, huh? But anyway, your book probably has a section called Stabilizing the Shore. And I feel like, you know, we should ask ourselves, what exactly is the problem here? What are we stabilizing the shore against? Because there's two things, two two things, two things going on here. There we go, two things, right? Um, and they're not really related to each other. First is the longshore current, uh, what we just talked about, longshore current beach drift, moving that sand downstream. An unrelated issue is what we kind of call beach erosion or sea level rise or that or that. And that's a different thing. OK, so uh, they're both a problem, but they're different problems. Right. And so let's talk about the longshore current first. Right. And so, you know. Uh, beaches, especially, you know, around Pinellas County, are barrier islands, right? And so let me end this and let me open up, um, there we go. Uh, let's look at, let's take a look at Google Earth, right? And so this is Pinellas County. I had the forethought to bring it up and get it where I wanted it. And so here's Pinellas County. And you'll notice, right, that the beaches in Pinellas County, if you want to go to the beach in Pinellas County, you don't just go to the shore, Right. Unless you may be on the on the bay side. But, you know, no, you you go you go across a bridge. Right. You know, here's the one to Clearwater. Right. You go across a bridge um, and on to the beach. The beach itself is an island, a low lying, narrow, uh, what we call a barrier island. OK. Now, uh, natural barrier islands, you know, look like you know that. Right. They, they, they you know, um, if we look around here, all this, let me just just, you know, right. All of this is not natural. I'm not saying it's bad. I don't care. You know, if you live there, that's great. I'm not worried about that. But that's not natural, right? That, that's where someone dumped fill in the intercoastal waterway to make waterfront property. That, you know, right? The, the natural part of the barrier island, right, is this thin, narrow strip of land right not this stuff hanging off of it here not not that stuff right and so yeah so if we look at a, a once again if we look at a natural barrier island let's say up here and i believe that's anclote i'm not sure but anyway um we can see uh, that you know it's once again just very narrow very low lying island but here's the trick it moves okay it moves and I'm going to move my Google Earth over a little bit, center it up a little bit better, make it a little bit bothering me. There we go. That's better. It moves, right? And so what happens is the longshore current removes sand from this upstream side, right? It removes sand and it carries it and it carries it and it carries it and it deposits it down here on the downstream right and you can see if you look let me get there we go you can see as you look at this these lobes of sand that have built out and they're building a new one there right and so uh, and so this island you know if i'm removing sand from the north side and i'm putting it on the south side that means that the whole island is moving um and it's moving you know feet per year um, it, it just is. This is not something, this is not like plate tectonics where it's moving, you know, a centimeter uh, per year and we can effectively ignore it. We cannot ignore this. This is something that's happening right now uh, and at a scale that we really do have to deal with, right? This is... Um, this is Honeymoon Island, a relatively undisturbed barrier island. And so we're removing sand from this side. It comes down and you can see that lobe of sand right there where it's getting deposited on that downstream side. Now, at the same time, barrier islands are moving. The inlets in between barrier islands are also moving. Right. And so, you know, as Honeymoon Island moves you know, we deposit sand here, extending Honeymoon Island to the south. The next island down, which I don't know what it's called, but down here it's Clearwater Beach. Okay, so let's just call it Clearwater Beach. So the Clearwater Beach Island is removing sediment here and moving it down and removing sediment here and moving it down. Now, here, there's nothing here, right? So, so we're pretty content to just let this build out and let this go away and so what you'll end up with is is a, is a gap here an inlet that's moving but well, there's nothing here so that's not really a problem okay let's look down here though yeah here it's a problem 
here it's a huge problem, right? This is Clearwater Beach. This is, oh, what's this called? This park down here south of Clearwater Beach. Okay, so anyway, um, right, so here we have a, here we have an inlet in between, is that Edgemont Key? I think, anyway, here we have an inlet between two barrier islands. We cannot have this inlet moving, right? We've got stuff here, clearly. We've got a bridge here, and so we have an issue. So what do we do? How do we keep these islands from moving when we have stuff on them, okay? Well, let's go back to the PowerPoint real quick because I want to show you a couple things, and then we'll, uh, let me get this so y'all can see it better. That's the one I want right there and there, right? And so, you know, this is the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse up here in North Carolina. Uh, if I get a chance, I'll head over there. But, um, uh, and it was sitting too close to the water and the island was moving. And so they actually ended up having to move the lighthouse and they moved it kind of downstream and they also moved it downstream relative to longshore current they also moved it inland uh you know to give it as long a life as possible because you know if you're going to move it don't move it there move it you know move it move it further but it was it literally in danger of falling into the atlantic ocean they didn't want it to do that um you know and once again the barrier islands move the endless in between them moves we already talked about that so what do we do how do we keep these things from moving well we build jetties, right? And all of the inlets uh, around Pinellas County um, have jetties, if there's any infrastructure in them at all, right? And so uh, here's the problem with jetties, though. Uh, they tend to accumulate sand on the upstream side relative to the longshore current, and you tend to get erosion on the downstream side, right? You can see here, I've got a much wider beach here than I do here. Uh, and so you wanna be very, very careful what you do on the downstream side of these barrier islands. Let's go back to Google Earth, because I, I really do wanna show you some things um, about Pinellas County. And so if I come back here to Google Earth, um, let's take a look. Let's take a look at um, at Upham Beach. And so let's see, that's not Upham. This is Upham. And so, yeah, so 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 here's this beach here. You're, you, you all may be familiar with it. It's, it's basically, um, 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 it's, it's, uh, let's see, let me make sure I get this right. Yeah. So this is Clearwater Beach kind of up here. And so up, I'm, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. This is Clearwater Beach up here. And so this is St. Pete Beach here. Sorry, guys, I'll get it right. I haven't been in Pinellas County for like a month. So, you know, anyway, so uh, this is St. Pete Beach and it's basically like Southern St. Pete Beach, right? And so if we look at it, we see they've got these, these silly, um, T groins here, right? These these erosion control structures here, and uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, they cannot keep sand on this beach. They simply cannot keep sand on this beach, and the reason they can't keep sand on this beach is because of these jetties right here. Uh, and so you've got an inlet here uh, that needs protecting because there's all kinds of infrastructure around it, and so they put a jetty that that builds a beach over here, but it starves the beach for sediment over here. And then you've got these three condos that built way too close to the water. They put in seawalls, which are also problematic, and so they're trying desperately to keep sand on this beach. And if you know uh, this beach, you know that they cannot keep sand on this beach at all. Let me uh, let me just see here. Uh, toolbar yeah that's what I want so let's uh let's just very quickly uh, we can actually jump back in time here and you can see there back in 2016 you can see how they had a much bigger problem uh, with erosion uh, there and then you know uh, if we kind of just look at it jumping through time we can see that you know they really do have a that's not a very good picture you know they really do have just a difficult time keeping sand on that beach and the reason they have that difficult time keeping sand on that beach is because of that jetty right there right it's trapping sediment on the upstream side so the downstream side we have erosion issues now here's a funny thing though um let's go to madeira beach 
right? Which is not far away at all, right? Just, I mean, it's just, just up the road, right? Look at it though, right? So we got the same kind of kind of same kind of situation. You've got um, you've got an inlet here with all kinds of infrastructure it needs protecting. You've got a, a, a jetty there. You've got a jetty there. But look, you're not getting any erosion issues, right? Beaches are tricky, crafty creatures. What you can get away with on one, you cannot necessarily get away with on another, and they might be very close to each other. Uh, and so, you know, here at Madura Beach, jetties, not a problem. Down on Upham, problem. Okay, so, you know, before you go jacking around with a beach, before you go spending a lot of money, uh, that might just make the problem worse. You need to get with a geologist, a coastal geomorphologist, I don't know, someone with some letters after their name and some knowledge about beaches to tell you what you can and cannot do on that beach. Uh, if we take a look at another one, uh, let's go. Let's go up and look at Clearwater. And so, uh, if I come up here, up here, right here, okay, and we look at Clearwater Beach. So, same kind of issue, right? Infrastructure, bridge, can't be, can't be letting this move too much, right? And so, but take a look. So, jetty here, trapping sediment, building a beach. But look at what they did on the downstream side, right? Nothing. They did nothing on the downstream side, right? They left it natural. They turned it into a public beach. They set the parking lot way back. They anticipated the erosion that would happen. Uh, they even put the road on the back side of the island, but they gave themselves a huge buffer here, right? They didn't put condos right there on the beach. No, no, no. They gave themselves a huge buffer that will let the beach here on the downstream side come into equilibrium uh and and they can afford to lose a few hundred feet of beach here because there's nothing there right this is what you want to do right you want to let that beach if you know you're going to get erosion on that downstream side let it don't don't put anything there right don't don't do once again don't do what they did here you know and put a put a jetty in on that north side and then put condos way too close uh, to the water on the south side. I mean, I'm not, if you live here, I'm not saying you're evil. I'm just saying that whoever built your condo long before you lived there put it way too close to the water. Uh, and, and so you're, you're always going to have problems. You're always going to have problems, um, on that, on that beach. And so, yeah, okay, so. Let's go back to the PowerPoint. So I'm not saying jetties are bad. They're not, but you just, you have to be very, very careful what you do. Where's my, where's my, there, there. Uh, you have to be very, very careful what you do um, on the downstream side of those jetties. Don't put anything there. Let that beach come into equilibrium if you know you're going to lose, you're going to lose uh, shoreline. So um, now, so that's jetties and that's kind of longshore current and whatnot, but we'll come back to that a little bit more too. But also then there's another problem, separate problem, and that's beach erosion, right? Um, there's two, two things going on here. Right now, I'm I'm not I'm not overly crazy about the term beach erosion. Right, the beach isn't going away. The beach is moving inland. Uh, the problem, of course, is that all our stuff is inland. Right, I mean that's where our houses are. That's where our roads are. Trying to move the computer, so I'm more in the picture. Um, you know that's where all our stuff is, and so we can't necessarily. We don't really want the beach moving inland. Um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, we can't just abandon the coastline, although, as we'll see with global climate change, we might have to abandon the coastline. Uh, but, you know, but but we can't, you know, we can't just we can't just up and do that. Right. And so it's a problem. Um, there's a couple things going on here. First of all, sea level is rising. It just is. That's what that graph is showing you. Um, it's rising for a couple reasons. First of all, um, as we warm the planet, we're melting ice. Uh, mostly, you know, and, and of course, the main ice that affects sea level is glaciers. If you melt ice caps, you don't necessarily raise sea level much because that ice is already in the water. But when you melt glaciers, that's ice that would normally be trapped on land that turns into water in the oceans and that raises sea level. The other thing, though, is as we warm the planet, um, we're warming the water. When things get warm, they expand. And so there's this whole thermal expansion thing going on uh, that, you know, as the water expands, it needs more room and it laps up on land. And the first time I heard about this, I was like, really? And uh, yeah, really, I'm like, oh, my gosh. So, so, yeah, so, 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 yeah, so we're getting hit by two things. 
we're melting ice and we're heating and expanding the water. And then both of those things equal water lapping up on land. Here's the thing, though. So people say, well, okay, look, you know, I, I don't, I don't even know. You know, the worst expectations of global climate change are, I don't know, let, let me say, you know, 20 feet of sea level rise. And my house is 30 feet above sea level, so I'm good. Yeah, no, you're not. Okay, so here's the thing. Um, when sea level rises, it has to come into equilibrium. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look. So here we are on a beach, right? We build a house. Now, we're not stupid. Uh, we don't put it, let me make sure, let me just, I like my laser pointer, right? We're not stupid. We don't put it here. We put it here, right? We build it up and back, okay? We're good, okay? Um, now, here's the thing. See this angle here between the water and the bottom, that angle right there? That angle is called the equilibrium slope. And beach is going to have that slope. Right. It's a combination of the wave energy, how much sediment you have, what kind of sediment do you have. All kinds of things go into that. But that slope is what it is. And it's what it is for a reason. And the beach is going to have that slope. Okay, so let's raise sea level. Okay, so now sea level's up here, right? We get a little nervous. It came this far up and it came that far inland. Um, so we get a little nervous, but we're okay. We're still pretty far above and pretty far back. So we're good. Here's the problem though. See that angle right there? Not the equilibrium slope too steep, right? The beach needs to get that slope back. Okay. And the only way the beach has to get that slope back is to erode landward, right? And so to kind of figure out where the new beach is, what we'll do is we'll extend the line of the beach inland. We'll extend the line of the water inland, and then all of that goes away. And so you can see the problem, right? The problem isn't that, you know, that you're going to um, uh, that you're going to flood. The problem is you're going to be undermined, right? I mean, if we look, let me just, let me just go back here. Um, sorry, I thought I had like pictures like this ready to go, but I don't. So let me just, let's go back here, right? The problem, and let me go back here and let me go back here so y'all can see everything. Ah, what did I do? Got it. Yeah, I've got everything. Leave me alone. There we go. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Got it. Here we go. So let's go there. And let's go here and there, right? The problem with these houses isn't that they're getting flooded, right? It's that they're getting undermined, right? And this is the thing that you see over and over again with images of beach erosion. It's not that, you know, that the, the, the sea level is going to be 30 feet higher and the house is only, you know, 20 feet higher. No, 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 no. The problem is that as the sea level rises, it chews its way inland, right? And buildings end up literally falling into the ocean because they've been undermined, right? So how far you are above sea level is not going to be the thing. That's not going to help you, okay? And so, you know, when we think about Florida and sea level rise, right, you know, you got the East Coast, you got the West Coast, sea level rises, and then it's going to chew its way inland, right? And, you know, we're already seeing this happening. It's already a problem in some local areas. You know, property values in Miami are actually falling, uh, near uh, near the Atlantic Ocean because it's flooding more, and so um, and so yeah. So when you think about when you think about sea level rise, don't just think about you know um, you know well am I you know higher up than uh, than the expected amount of sea level rise? That's not the point. Uh, the point is uh, you're going to get undermined, right? The, the sea level is going to rise and it's going to come under your house and that's the problem and so yeah so and that's the way it works okay so so what do we do what do we do and my next slide is kind of messed up guys hold on i'm going to pause this fix this i will be right back okay and from your point of view i am instantly back of course i didn't get myself into my quiz interview while i was gone because i was a bad bad professor okay so here we go and show presenter view. There we are. Okay, so so how do we stop this, right? I mean, you know, um, you know, we we got a problem here, right? We got we got you know the sea level is you know mark the beach is marching toward our house, and while our house might be ten or twenty feet above sea level, that's not going to matter, right? And so what do we do? Well, our first impulse is portion concrete. 
and um, we call this hard stabilization, right? Concrete, rock, something like that. Uh, and seawalls are the most common uh, form of hard stabilization. Now, here's a problem. Seawalls don't prevent beach erosion. Seawalls cause beach erosion. Okay, you're not going to save your beach by putting a seawall on it. You're just not, right? Because here's what happens. The minute that wave energy even touches that seawall, that wall is going to get undermined and you're going to wash out that sand, right? Here's just a thing from the Army Corps of Engineers showing, you know, you put that wall and it's not long at all before that beach between the wall and the water goes away. And in fact, ask yourself, you know, as you drive around Pinellas County, how often, and look at my hands for a second if you can, how often do you see, you know, any beats, let me look at my hand, oh, there we go, oh, cool, that's weird, it's like mirror image, okay, anyway, how often do you see, you know, any beats between the seawall and the water, right, and you don't, right, it always goes from here's the wall, bam, there's the water, it's right up against it, right, you don't see, and if you do see beats there, it's not going to last long, it's not going to last long, right, so let's go back here, let's go back and look at um, Upham Beach again, just so we can point and laugh, right, and so once again, uh, jetty there, trapping sediment, downstream erosion problem, three condos way too close to the water, what do they do, they put in seawalls, Right. And so the minute, the minute that wave energy touches that wall in a storm or a really high tide or anything like that, that beach is going to be gone. It literally takes a couple of hours. Um, it does not take long at all. And so, um, you know, uh, they, they feel like they can't do anything else because, well, they built too close to the water and they need to protect what's behind them. But but that beach is never going to keep sand on it. It's just really not. Um, and so um, so they put these weird tea groins in here to try to trap sediment and they don't really work all that well. And so, yeah, um, I mean, down here, they don't have erosion problems at all. I don't know why they have tea groins down there, but they don't need them. Um, but, you know, up here, you know, yeah, and once again, you know, you can see the seawalls right there. And if you've ever been there, you know that people walk on those seawalls all the time. So, so yeah, so seawalls, they do an okay job of protecting what's behind them, but they require maintenance. Um, but, you know, but but you're not going to have any beach. You're, you're, you're just not going to keep sand um, on that um, on that beach. And so let me come over here and do that again. I, I tried to figure out how to do this in one click, but. It wouldn't do it for me. So, yeah. Now, you can build higher tech seawalls, right? I mean, you can, you know, you can curve it and you can put rock at the bottom of it to prevent the erosion. I mean, you can build higher tech seawalls, but still notice there's no beach there, right? Look, people don't people don't flock to coastal communities to, to walk along the seawall. I mean, okay, sometimes you do. Like Galveston, Texas, that's kind of a thing. But usually they want beaches, right? And so, uh, and you know, if you have a seawall, you're not going to have a beach. You're really just not going to have a beach. And once again, that wave energy, once that wave energy touches that wall, um, that sand is gone. That sand is just gone. Uh, so, okay, so maybe we know a little bit. Maybe we know about groins, right? Maybe we know that, you know, that... Um, uh, well, we know about jetties, right? We know that if I build a wall out into the water, what that does is that shuts down the longshore current and you accumulate sand. Well, that actually sounds like what we need, right? You accumulate sand on the upstream side. Um, and maybe that's what we need, right? So let's build a jetty, but not at an inlet. And when you build a jetty, not at an inlet, it's called a groin, right? And so, uh, and it's just a wall of rock that goes out into the water, right? Well, groins have the same issue that jetties have. Yes, you will accumulate sand on the upstream side, but you run the danger of erosion on the downstream side, right? You can see here, I can tell you the longshore current here is moving this way. I can tell you the longshore current here is moving this way, right? And so, yeah, so so um, so you want to once again be really careful what you do on the downstream side, and you might need to build another groin. Uh, you know, in a lot of places they'll build a groin, trap sediment, build another groin, you know, and and just keep on doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it until eventually you just run out of sand. Uh, you know, beaches make enemies of neighbors because someone upstream will do something that affects their neighbor downstream. And it just it can really be a hot mess um, out in California. 
a mode of hard stabilization that they use a lot are breakwaters. This one's in Long Beach. And um, the breakwater is this bit right here. This wall of rock running parallel uh, to, the, to the shoreline. And it's meant to shut down the wave energy to enable boats to navigate into this channel. Um, and, but notice that it shuts down the wave action, so it, so it shuts down the longshore current, and you end up accumulating sediment on either side of the jetty. Well, that's good. Uh, at least good here. Now, what you really want to be careful of, though, is what's going on down here outside of the picture. Are you having erosion problems down here? And I actually found this on Google Earth, and no, they're not. It's good. It's good. But it's not always good, right? This is Italy in the Mediterranean of all places. Um, and so you can see there's a breakwater there. Beach builds out. Um, and they're okay. But their neighbor's running out of sand. So what do they do? They build a breakwater, right? They have a little bit less beach, though, right? These people build, and now you're out of sand, right? And, and this is the thing. Let me go. You can see breakwaters in Pinellas County, actually. Let's, let's pop up Google Earth here real quick. And let's go back up to Honeymoon Island, which is a really nice place, by the way. Once we can all get out again. Um, and if you want to get out, check out Honeymoon Island. Sorry, that's not Honeymoon. That's Clearwater. And so Honeymoon Island right here. I, I'm, I'm losing my Pinellas County geography. It's been so long since I've been there. But anyway, um, so it costs a few bucks to get on. Uh, but it's really pretty. It's a very it's a very nice natural area. And so if you look, you can see, first of all, they got a long parking lot here that is set a reasonable amount back from the beach. Life is good. Here, on the other hand, we have an issue. Um, there's actually, I believe, gopher tortoises back here. And so I don't think they had the option of putting the parking lot back here. Um, and it's because gopher tortoises are an endangered species, and so there's all kinds of stuff that you can't do. Um, and so they kind of had to push the parking lots further toward the beach, and they didn't want to make them any smaller. And so the parking lot's basically in the beach. And, you know, if you've ever been there, you know there's sand in this parking lot. I mean, it is just on the beach. And so they needed to build out the beach a little bit more. And so look, there's a breakwater, right? Here's another breakwater. You can see how they're building sand out here. Here's another one here. They're doing okay, I guess. I mean, I don't know. Um, and you know, there's another. Yeah, you can see you can see what they're doing. But they're using breakwaters to try and keep sand on this beach because they built their parking lot way too close to the water here, way too close. Um, but anyway, but if you do get a chance, definitely check out. Um, because the other nice thing is look at all these hiking trails up through here and all of this undisturbed beach. It's really nice. It's really nice up there. So um, so if you, once we can get out and get around again, uh, maybe go check out Honeymoon Island. It's, it's, it's a very, very nice, uh, very undisturbed kind of a beach. And you'll get a chance to get a, a close look at some erosion structures. These breakwaters are kind of interesting. And if you fish, there's a lot of fish around there because that's structure. So anyway, uh, as with all hard stabilization techniques, so, you know, if you do this, you want to be very, very careful about what you do uh, downstream. Okay, so there we go. And then, you know, finally, or not finally, but next to finally, there is, you know, and I'm sorry, my words are weird on here. Uh, um, I, I changed the formatting of my slides and I forgot to fix this, but that's okay. Uh, there is um, renourishment or nourishment, right? Look, right, if... If the problem is you have a beach and there's not enough sand, add sand. Okay. Uh, here's here's the thing though. We do okay. First of all, we do this all the time in Pinellas County, all the time. Uh, but we're kind of holding our breath, hold, uh, holding our nose, and doing it because it's 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 not the ideal thing to do. But a lot of times we find ourselves in a position where we just don't have any choice. But here's the thing. First of all, it's tricky to get it right. Um, it just is okay. There, there, there's engineering issues. You have to match the sand. It's not just get your cousin out there with their bulldozer to pile up a bunch of sand on the beach. That will not work. Okay. It will not work. You need to hire people who know what they're doing. And I'll talk about why here in a minute. The other thing is it's temporary. Uh, um, even the best beach renourishment project will not last forever. What you do is you buy yourself time before you have to do it again and then again and then again. Now, a good 
a well-designed one will last for a long time, but ultimately it's not a, okay, we did that and now we never ever have to do it again. You absolutely will have to do it again. How long depends on how much you spent the first time. Uh, and so um, the other thing is it's not on a bullet point. It's not cheap, y'all. It is really not cheap. It is you know, on the order of a million or two dollars per mile. Um, it is not cheap to do. Uh, and the better the job you do, the more expensive it is. But once again, it's temporary, right? Look, right, look, here we go. Sorry, sorry about the small grainy picture, but Miami, right? Uh, they need a beach, right? They've got, they've got erosion problems. They need a beach. So they build a beach. Great. There we go. Several million dollars later, it looks like that. Yay, beach. A year later, looks like that, right? It's practically gone. A uh, poorly designed beach nourishment project do not last. Um, let's point and laugh at Upham Beach one more time. I always take my geology classes out here for a nice, fun beach field trip, and we point and laugh because, yeah, uh, it is a great example of what not to do on a beach. It truly is, and I passed it. It's right here. Okay, so so let me do this, and let me let's let's zoom in on this a little bit, and so uh, and let me let me uh, let me do the time thing again here because I want to find I want to find something in particular. Two thousand eight. I'll find it here. We go. So you oh, look look at that. I mean, that water is right up, right up against that seawall. Um, 2010, we can see the water just kind of doing its stuff here. And then I want to say right around in here, um, right around in here somewhere. Where is it? I'll find it. I swear I will. There it is, right? So 2015, right? They re nourish the beach. They pump sand up on the beach, right? Because look, right? Look at what it looked like before, right? I mean, the picture's awful, but you can see that seawall is in the Gulf of Mexico, right? I mean, there there is zero beach here, right? And so several million dollars later, it looks like that, right? Nice, wide beach, life is good, but you can see the beginnings of a problem here. You can see how that beach goes inward here, and then it bulges outward here, right? This beach is, this this area over here, the public area, is never really a problem. The problem is over here by these condos, right? So that's February of 2015. February of 2016, a year later, it looks like that, right? The whole project has completely washed away. Um, poorly designed beach re-nourishment projects do that. They do not last. Now, what do I mean by poorly designed? Well, let's take a look and then we'll be pretty much done. And so, um, so once again, let's, uh, let's, um, let me get this going. And so let's go back to this, right? So we have a problem, right? So we need, we need to, we need to pump some sand onto this beach. Okay. So let's do that. I'm not sure what this line over here is. I have no idea. Interesting. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's pump some sand onto this beach. Okay. So we do. So, so let's say we go to, uh, we go to someone and we say, Hey, we need to re nourish our beach. And they say, okay, look, I'll do that for you. Right. For, you know, I'll create, I don't know, let's say that's a hundred feet of beach, right? I'll create a hundred feet of beach for you. I'll charge you a million dollars a mile and you know, you'll have a hundred feet of beach. Okay. Well, here's the problem. That is not the equilibrium slope. Remember the equilibrium slope? That's not it. And so this is why beach renourishment is always temporary, right? That beach is going to chew through that and try to get back to that equilibrium slope. So it's going to, you know, the day you stop piling up sand, it's going to start chewing back through that, that, um, that beach. And so what you do is you buy yourself time. Well, if you want to buy yourself more time, I'm touching my face. I shouldn't do that. If you buy yourself more time, if you want to, you do that. Right? You give yourself the same amount of beach, but look at what they did. They piled more sand out here uh, and got something closer to the equilibrium slope. That will last longer. The problem is that it costs more money. I accidentally captured my mouse when I captured this image. Oh, well, I um. You know, uh, if you if you if you um, dump, you know, that sorry, bad, you make the same amount of beach, but you have more sand underwater, right? Costs more to do. And so, you know, your county commissioners or whoever, you know, faced with, well, this I'll do for a million dollars a mile and give you 100 feet of beach. And then another company comes in and says, well, I'm going to do this, uh, but it's going to cost you a million and a half dollars per mile. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they do that, <laughs> and so it just it just 
doesn't last, right? And I don't even know what they did up on. It was just a hot mess. I watched them do it, and I was like, yeah, no, that's not going to last. So anyway, um, there's one other thing I just want to mention, and that is soft stabilization. Now, this will not help if your beach is too far gone, but on the order of maintaining a beach, right? If your beach is doing okay, one way to keep it doing okay is to plant you know, environmentally friendly, natural native plants like seagrass and sea grape and things like that. Use shells and driftwood to armor the beach and prevent erosion, right? It makes these really pretty, very natural looking beaches that are resistant to erosion. Now, it's not going to help if you've got a huge jetty upstream starving your beach of sediment, but it will help to maintain your beach. So, soft stabilization is kind of the opposite of hard stabilization, kind of. So, anyway, okay, so that's it for dynamic ocean and beach erosion. So, and that's it for the material on the test. I will probably get around to posting um, at least my global climate change lecture um, and maybe a little bit more about meteorology too. Uh, but for as far as material to study for the test, this is it. Okay. All righty. Uh, Y'all stay safe out there. Get me if you need me. And um, I'll, uh, I'll be, I'll, I don't know, I might be seeing you around. I might not. But anyway, so y'all take care. Okay. Bye-bye.